Hi everyone, my name is Marky and I'm the curator here at the Geneva History Museum. Today I'm going to talk to you about a man who has been called many things in life. Teacher, naturalist, environmentalist, eco-terrorist, prankster, law-breaking crook, and my favorite, arch criminal. However, most people called him the fox. For those of you who may not know who he was, he was pretty much everything I said before. And actually, it wasn't until his death in 2001 that anyone outside of his personal circle knew his real identity. So before I begin, and because I know there may be people here who were around during the Fox's time or knew him personally, I just want to let you know where I got my information. I used his autobiography, Raising Cain, as a guide and then cross-referenced the information in there with various newspaper articles, since he wrote about it 30 years after the fact. And let's be honest, who can remember every detail of something that happened 30 years prior? So, who was the fox? Well, spoiler alert, he was a man named Jim Phillips. Jim was born in Aurora, Illinois in 1930, but was raised on the north side of Chicago for part of his childhood. Jim fell in love with the rural western suburbs while visiting his grandfather's asparagus farm in Montgomery, and eventually his family moved there. Jim's autobiography relays some cute stories from his time in Chicago, but I want to focus on his time as the fox. Jim earned a biology degree from Northern Illinois University in 1959, and by 1968 was teaching science at a middle school in Oak Lawn. One day, while teaching his class of eighth graders about the dangers of pollution, the class called him out on his negative contributions to the environment by driving a pickup truck to work. He explained that he had yet had to get to work somehow. Mass public transportation was not yet readily available in the area, and Detroit had not introduced any sort of anti-pollution devices on their vehicles. When the kids asked why, Phillips explained that everything came down to money, and research on anti-pollution technology was likely not profitable. They were fired up by that. So to quell their tension, he suggested they write their complaints on his own truck, minus any obscenities. We don't have a photo of his truck, but Jim relayed in his book that the sayings included, GM pollutes our air, GM's lust for profit kills our air, GM, clean up your act, signed the kids' names, and profit plus greed equals air pollution. His truck got many looks during his commute to and from work. Many people honked or gave him a peace sign and some just frowned. This got Jim thinking about how else he could affect change. The Fox's first battle, as he called it, was with Armour and Company, a Chicago company that had its hands in a lot of different ventures, including meatpacking, canned foods, and most famously, soaps. The company was actually pretty terrible before all of the pollution issues started with the Fox. They fought against unions, paid extremely low wages, poisoned soldiers, it's a lot. Fortunately, the company is no longer in business. They dissolved in 1983, and their different industries were taken over by other com companies. Around 1962, Armour set up a plant near Montgomery, Illinois, manufacturing soap, glycerin, and other products. According to Jim, there were rumors the plant was kicked out of Chicago due to its stench and water pollution. The photo here shows the Armour plant in Chicago in 1910. The plant in Montgomery was reputed to be the most productive soap manufacturing facility in the world. Unfortunately, it got this way due to cutting corners. Its sewage system poured gallons and gallons of what was supposed to only be cooling water and stormwater runoff into the nearby Mill Creek, not to be confused with Geneva's Mill Creek. What it actually contained was septic water, soap residue, and various fats that were used to make the soap. All of this bypassed the internal sewer system and resulted in a biologically dead waterway. As Jim described it, dead animal bodies as a result of the pollution only added to the disgusting sludge. What was worse was that the creek emptied into the Fox River, affecting even more ecosystems and animals. The plant had a contract with the Aurora Sanitary District, which allowed Armour Dial to dump 830 pounds of suspended solids into the district's sewer system each day. The concentration was not to exceed 200 milligrams of solids per liter of waste, but Armour Dial consistently surpassed the limit, causing the district's waste treatment facilities to overflow into the Fox River. Water wasn't the only thing Armour was polluting, though. The boiler house stacks of the factory pumped out plumes of oily soot, scented in a variety of aromas thanks to the steam-heated fats and oils. Jim didn't notice the issues with the plant until he moved back to the area in 1967. 
However, his friend Dick Young, the Kendall County Building and Zoning Officer, had been trying for years to get both state and local government involved to stop the pollution from the plant. One of the issues was that no one in government really understood the severity of dumping this much into the box. The Environmental Protection Agency didn't exist yet, and there were no real laws protecting the natural environment. Another issue was the county spear in scaring off Armour Dial. Dick was rightfully frustrated by the lack of enforcement and assistance. There wasn't much he could do on his own since the issues weren't happening directly in his county. Eventually, he decided to go to the public. He spoke to the press about the issues, and while initially no one listened, a group of homeowners who were also upset with what the plant was doing did come forward. Their yards and swimming pools were ravaged by soot, the air stunk. The homeowners formed an improvement association, and while that gave them no legal status or longevity, they were organized and smart. In February 1969, Jim and Dick ran into each other. It wasn't long before their conversation turned to the giant soap elephant in the room. According to Jim, Dick went off about the whole situation, how the Aurora Sanitary District was just letting the plant get away with something more than they should, how they were hooking up many subdivisions to already overloaded sewer systems, how uncontrolled development was causing sediment to clog the tributaries of the Fox River with herb and pesticide. Jim quickly learned exactly how and why the Fox River had gone into such disarray. According to Jim, Dick's tirade was a wake-up call. He began to stake out Mill Creek near the plant. Everything Dick said was true. The creek was biologically dead. He looked at the plant responsible for the carnage in front of him and decided then that it was time to become personally involved. By March, the Fox River had become a no body contact stream with a high rate of cancer in the fish. Jim made a plan. He collected litter from the side of nearby roads, bagged it and placed it, in a, placed it near a catch basin about a third of a mile from the factory. Around 8 p.m., he went back to the basin. He started by dropping in a large tree stump, then all of the litter he found, which included small appliances, rugs, bags of refuse, and furniture. The whole thing took around 45 minutes. He topped everything off with several bags of cement, left a small note, and signed it, Fox. Now I want to pause the story here for a moment to explain Jim's choice of a fox for a pseudonym. In fact, I'll just read to you what he said. I was out walking one day in a natural area just west of Montgomery. As usual, the local soap company was stinking up my area, and I was reflecting on that with the darker side of my nature. While mulling things over, I stopped dead in my tracks. Absent-mindedly, I had walked up to within six feet of a red fox. The fox had captured a hen pheasant and was so busily engrossed in its meal that it failed to notice anyone approaching. Concealed in the foot-high grass, it suddenly sensed an imminent danger. We were both frozen for an instant in time. It was startling to be this close to such a wary animal. The fox must have been terrified. We were face to face. Then in an instant, it was gone. Then something happened that I had never seen before. For the first 25 or so yards of its flight, it actually tucked its tail between its legs and ran off as if expecting to feel the bite of the BBs from some painful blast that might be unleashed. Not feeling any blast, the animal began to lengthen its stride to a hard lope and the tail unfurled itself and flowed gracefully behind him as he headed for safety. While watching, two thoughts impinged on my consciousness. I found myself smiling and softly said, don't worry, pal, no one is going to shoot you. The other thought was the realization of an incredible kinship with this running animal. The stink of the soap plant washed over the rare prairie plants struggling to survive in this natural area. With this foul intrusion on the scene, I felt like running for my life too. Just like the fox, maybe all of us were running. Away from ignorance and greed? Toward what? Or should we, should we be running away at all? I didn't know it then, but it would all come together soon enough. Not much came from this first attack by the fox. Construction, roofs, construction crews came and cleared it out, and eventually the water was back to the disgusting mess that it was. In April, Jim decided to have another go at the basin. This time, he used bales of straw and plastic sheeting to plug the basin. Again, he topped off the job with cement mix and another note signed, Fox. He was explicit in his note this time. If they stopped dumping, he'd stop plugging. The next day, construction workers were back to unplug the sewer. This time, the company stopped dumping for a while, though they did add steel rods and a lock to the manhole to ensure there would be no more tampering. Eventually, the dumping commenced again and dead, life floated on the well, dead wildlife floated on the water. Again, Jim plugged up the sewer. 
this time leaving a note that read, what God has wrought, we must preserve and protect, not desecrate for the sake of profit. A construction crew was there the next day, along with a squad car, but this time the company wasn't just cleaning the sewer, but replacing the whole section. As the job would take several days and the sewer was left unprotected, Jim decided to plug it again. This time, he attracted front page attention from the press. Little stinker strikes again. This last job also caused the company to hire overnight security for the water basin. Throughout the rest of the year and into 1970, Jim attacked Armour Dial through words rather than physical action. He printed hundreds of letters and signs like the one here that he hung around shopping centers and malls. This one reads, hi there, my name is Armour Dial. I make soaps, deodorants, and really nice profits. Oh yes, I also kill your environmental quality. Now, aren't you glad you use Dial? Don't you wish everyone would? Yours truly, Armour Dial. And he signed it, Fox. After Jim's last attack on the water basin, the company completely replaced that part of the sewer, meaning the basin was no longer accessible. So he turned his attention to another manhole closer to the plant and about 500 feet from the original target. For this part of the sewer, he couldn't just jam it with litter. He had to construct a large plug or dam from wood and iron. Dick Young helped him create a large wooden disc, but Jim knew he needed a professional to create the large iron H frame for the desk to sit in, disc to sit. He traveled to a blacksmith shop in Caneville. In Jim's words, this little cluster of rock-ribbed rural Republican conservatism would be about the last place anyone would ever imagine that the seeds of rebellion might find any kind of fertile ground. Jim showed the smith his drawing of the H frame he required. After a back and forth with the smith, wherein the smith explained that he wasn't sure he could make something right and put his name on it if he didn't know what its purpose was, Jim relented and explained what the soap company was doing and what he was planning to do about it. The smith and his son got to work on the frame, and when it was finished, he handed him a bill for $6.35. Since he said it sounded like Jim was doing the right thing, he only charged him for materials. The quote on the screen is what Jim wrote after telling the story of the smith. If you believe in what you're doing, other cooks might let you use their kitchen, even if you are a bit radical. And as you'll see, throughout the years, Jim will get help from a lot of other cooks. About a week after getting everything assembled, the box struck. He descended to the bottom of the access tube by the attached ladder, pushed the butterfly valve dam downstream from the main hole about manhole about 24 feet and jammed the four legs of the steel H-frame into the tile joints, tightening up the bolts with a ratchet. Then he unfolded the hinged plywood disc and snapped it against the frame. He slid an attached steel angle iron across the now open disc, similar to barring a door, and got the hell out of there, his words. After this attack, the company got serious. They contacted the county sheriff, chief of police, and several private detectives. They wanted the fox hunted down and prosecuted. The chief and private detectives were just as heated about the fox, but the sheriff, as well as his police force, were less concerned. In fact, Jim had a pretty good relationship with a few officers, to the point that they would warn him of planned stakeouts. As long as there was no wanton destruction or injury to persons, the fox was okay by them. In mid-1970, Jim got in touch with the Improvement Association that had been complaining about Dial for years. The association got the idea to create quarter-sized day glow stickers with a message on them. There were enough willing members within the association to set up a mail tree to send the stickers to friends all over the country. They would then be placed on certain products and grocery stores. With the Fox's resources deflated by the signs he'd been hanging, he and Dick went to their personal physician who had indicated a willingness to help the Fox. With the hefty donation in hand, the Fox and his fellow cooks got to work producing the stickers and mailing them out. Now, Jim didn't just say, hey, let's mail a bunch of stickers to our friends to have them put everywhere. No, he crafted an elaborate Ocean's Eleven type plan. On Wednesday, March 24th, 1971, everyone who received stickers would go to their local grocery store and pick out several dial products to put in their cart. While they were walking around the store, they would place the stickers on the products in their cart and then put them back on the shelves, minus one. They would then purchase that one product, remove the wrapper, and mail it to Armour & Company with a letter asking for an explanation. Pretty cool, but that wasn't everything. On Tuesday, the day before the sticker campaign, the Fox's friends dropped off several trash bags of litter next to a sack of limes the Fox left just north of the sewer outlet of the plant. At 8 p.m. that night, one of the Fox's friends picked him up in his truck. He dropped him off a few 
few yards from where the litter and limes were placed. Fox then trudged through the field, grabbed the litter and limes, and walked to the sewer outlet. At the same time, the secretary of one of the members of the Improvement Association and a friend were walking into the police station to report a prowler near the sewer outlet. The women were so convincing that the officers called the police chief at home to let him know. The chief was positive it was the fox and called in assistance. After a rather dramatic chase through a wooded area, the fox got away and he got his message across. Along with the litter and limes was a note addressed to Armor Dial. Armor Dial has polluted this creek long enough. The animals of the forest can no longer stand it. With a bright, small sticker on the bottom with the fox's logo. Newspapers for the next several days posted that the fox was foiled, that he evaded the police, that the wife of a confidant inadvertently leaked the plan. The only part that was true was the evasion. Everything else was planned. The stickers began showing up in grocery stores across the US, Canada, and overseas. The fox's exploits received both national and international attention, but Armour Dial wasn't his only fight. The fox's second battle was with William F. Jobbins. Jobbins owned two factories across the Fox River from each other in Aurora. One manufactured glycerin and the other produced aluminum. Dick Young actually introduced Jim to both factories. The glycerin plant had a sewer that ran directly into the Fox River. Downstream from the sewer outlet was a dead zone. Gray fungus grew on the rocks of the riverbed. The aluminum plant had four square chimneys, which let out huge clouds of gray and black smoke laced with sparks that traveled slowly westward. Not only that, on the north end of the plant was a giant two-chambered septic tank, which overflowed with industrial waste. Can you guess where its outlet led? Directly into the Fox River. Unfortunately, the river wasn't the only thing being polluted. Less than 300 feet from the aluminum factory were homes. Dick explained that many were immigrants who worked at low-paying jobs in the area. In Jim's own words, there was a grade school less than a block away where those who pursued the American dream sent their kids for an education and to have a playground to play in. This was the neighborhood the aluminum factory was defiling. Unfortunately, Jobbins was on the Aurora Township Board and the people in the neighborhood didn't exactly have enough clout to try and challenge it. Jim refers to Jobbins as Bob Rotten in his book, and honestly, I think that nickname is a little bit too nice. In February 1970, one of the neighbors of the plant finally filed suit in county court, citing the damage done to his sightings and screens by the fumes from the plant. He also hung a large sign in his yard that read, Welcome to Pollution Hollow, where the politicians can get courts to rule any way they want. Unfortunately, these actions had no effect. The suit against Jobbins kept getting delayed in court. While the glycerin plant still stunk up the neighborhood, the aluminum plant caught Jim's attention the most. Every 15 minutes or so, it would pump out clouds of black smoke and sparks. The air quality became intolerable. Jim filed petitions with the newly created State Environmental Protection Agency and had a friendly tinsmith construct a stack cap. In March, Jim climbed the roof and slid the cap on. The cap was up there for only less than two for less than 24 hours before it was removed by the company, but the message was still received. In April, Jim and Dick hit the aluminum plant, aluminum plant again, but this time their target was the two-chambered septic tank. They hauled a polystyrene rose cone, a gallon bucket of hydraulic cement, and a rope to their destination. Jim jumped into the eight feet deep, eight foot deep tank. He then proceeded to fill the cone with the cement and stuff it into the outlet pipe. In a matter of minutes, the cement began to set and their job was done. When Dick got home, he notified the police that the fox struck again. Jim and Dick also decided to take the fight directly to Jobbins. After securing, securing a very dead and very smelly skunk from the side of the road and adding in some brake fluid to the concoction for good measure, the two men drove to Jobbins' home, dumped the skunk on his front porch and planted a sign in his front yard. Jim never relays what the sign said, but I assume it had colorful language regarding the factory's terrible environmental habits. The men made several trips to Jobbins' home, one time slapping a bumper sticker which read, Go Fox, Stop Pollution. Even after capping the smokestacks, plugging the sewer outlet, and harassing Jobbins, Jim felt like he was losing the game. His appeals to the Attorney General about the plant's pollution failed to generate any legal action, and his physical efforts had done nothing but aggravate. No changes were being made, so he decided to think bigger. Through a little research, Jim discovered that Jobbins Aluminum Plant was actually a subsidiary of a larger one based in Chicago, 
and it was obvious that the men in Aurora were failing to let the home office know what was happening. So he decided to let them know himself. He found out where the home office was and formed his plan. He gathered some of the waste from the plant's outflow as well as animal specimens he found nearby into a five gallon bucket. He waited a few days before heading out. He parked his truck, sounds plates, across the front door of the office and headed in. He approached the receptionist and said, I have a gift for your president from the animals and people of the Fox River Valley. He handed her an envelope with his letter and proceeded to open the can, spilling its contents all over the floor and ran out the door. Jim wrote that the look on the receptionist's face haunt him, haunted him and he felt bad for ruining her day. So he sent half a dozen roses and an apology letter to be delivered to be delivered to her the next day when she had cooled down. The final step in his plan was a phone call to Mike Royko at Chicago Daily News. He explained what he had just done in the U.S. Steel office, and Royko immediately invited him over for an interview, which he accepted. His interview and subsequent relationship with Royko made the Fox into a well-known name. Mike Royko wasn't some small-time reporter, but a well-known and trusted one. He would even go on to win a Pulitzer Prize for commentary in 1972. His columns for the Chicago Daily News were published in newspapers across the country. The, the Fox started getting requests for interviews from Newsweek, Time Magazine, and NBC. The Fox's third battle was with a little company called U.S. Steel. For those who don't know, U.S. Steel was founded in 1901 by Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, and a few others. They had a large factory on Chicago's south side known as South Works, and a factory in Gary, Indiana known as Gary Works. The Fox decided to go after U.S. Steel for a few reasons. One, he was coming off of this big attack on Armor Dial, wherein he was chased through the woods and wanted to steer clear of, what that, of that plant for a while. Two, he still felt he hadn't done enough and needed to go bigger. And three, U.S. Steel had been pumping millions and millions of gallons of industrial waste into Lake Michigan every day from Gary Works and South Works while Chicago's water intake cribs were sucking up billions of gallons of that same water for both human and non-human consumption. The Fox wasn't the only one who noticed though. The attorney generals of Illinois and the federal government had lawsuits against the corporation, but the lawyer, corporation's lawyers were doing everything in their power to delay the courts. Meanwhile, plumes of black smoke and steam emerged from the smokestacks of the factory and the odors of solvents, sulfur, and other chemicals spread through the air. A stream flowed from the factory into the lake with black, oily water. The fox decided to start by letting everyone know exactly what the factory was doing to the lake. On his drive back home, he spotted a train trestle close to the interstate and decided it would be the perfect place for a sign, a very large sign. Once he got back, he purchased 200 feet of muslin, laid it out, and began writing his sign. In four-foot block letters, he wrote, we are involved in murdering Lake Michigan. He included U.S. Steel's logo and signed it, the Fox. He put it up in the middle of the night when few cars were on the road. U.S. Steel now knew it had an enemy in the Fox, and this was only the beginning. He started distributing hundreds of flyers denouncing U.S. Steel for their environmental recklessness and posted them in shop windows all throughout the Chicago Loop. The press caught on right away. The Fox's big attack against U.S. Steel occurred in late 1970. He snuck onto the Southworks grounds with a bucket in hand, blending in against the hundreds of factory workers. He collected some of the waste from a ditch into his bucket and walked out. He then put together a poster detailing the large salaries earned by U.S. Steel's board of directors and explained how their policies of recklessness affected pollution abatement programs designed to enhance water and wildlife quality near their facilities. He ended his poster with the saying of a Roman gladiator, we who are about to die salute you. After signing the poster, he scooped some of the waste into a jar and wrapped it in Christmas paper with a bow. He then gathered a few dead wildlife specimens, a frog, perch, and crayfish, and carefully placed them into a small handmade black casket. Jim called Mike Royko to give him a heads up about what was about to happen. He put on a suit and tie, picked up his two accomplices, his nieces, and headed to U.S. Steel's head office downtown. When he arrived, he instructed the the girls to wait near a newsstand so he could scope out the location where he was set. And when he was satisfied, he headed up the elevator to the executive office. When he reached the receptionist desk, he exclaimed, I am from the Fox Foundation for Conservation and Education, and we have an award for U.S. Steel for their outstanding contributions to our environment. 
With that, he opened the glass jar and poured it on the floor. Unfortunately, some of the concoction got on the receptionist's desk. He then placed the poster on a nearby couch with the casket and slapped a Go Fox Fight Pollution bumper sticker on a glass door and left. And once again, the fox found himself headlining articles newspapers across the country, thanks in part to Mike Brayko's report of what happened. He also found himself being invited to speak with many different groups like this one. The invitation came from the Environmental Action Committee Youth Councils of North Carolina. It was sent to the county clerk, William Bullrath, as the envelope was addressed to the courthouse. The invitation was for the Fox to meet with North, Carolina, North Carolina's Lieutenant Governor H. Patrick Taylor in Raleigh. And Jim, Jim never writes if he actually went or not, so I am unsure if he RSVP'd. And he attracted attention from overseas as well. A man named Jun Wee reached out to the Fox to let him know that the Japanese admired what he had done in the fight against polluters. The Fox responded, stating that he's feeling pretty good about what he's done, since Armor Dial applied for federal financing of an $8.5 million air and water pollution control program at their plant in Montgomery. The Fox attacked U.S. Steel one more time in July 1971, and one of his more risky stunts, the Fox, with the help of two friends, adhered a 42 by 36 inch poster to the Picasso sculpture in the Civic Center Plaza now commonly referred to as Daily Plaza. The poster, drawn by a freelance artist Jim named Bob Kay, included an outline of Lake Michigan featuring an outhouse with a crescent moon on the door. The outhouse was seated in the lake amidst a pool of pollution with fumes rising from the water. A U.S. Steel executive was entering the outhouse as he looked toward a figure on the shore. The figure was a caricature of Mayor Richard Daly with a finger in his mouth, dressed in shorts and wearing a crown. Behind him was a wagon with a scroll marked Lake Airport Plants. The executive was saying, feel free to use the lake, Dick. We always do. For those who don't know or realize, the Picasso sculpture was actually assembled by U.S. Steel at Gary Works. So it was the perfect place for the poster. Unfortunately, the fox struck in the middle of the day. So the poster was almost immediately taken down and the fox was almost arrested. But as you can see, his message still got out thanks to the press. In the early 1970s, Jim decided to involve the youth of the area and created Friends of the Fox, a loose network of high school students from Aurora West, Naperville Central, and Proviso West. The students did everything from pass out armor dial stickers to pose at mourner, as mourners at a mock funeral for the Fox River. They also created pseudo recycling bins out of 55 gallon drums and distributed them throughout Cook, DuPage, Kane, and Kendall counties. The Fox had many fans, some of whom decided to turn him into a comic superhero. In 1972, Lou Oates and illustrator Saul Levine created this 30 page comic book they called Tales of the Fox, Pollution Fighter. The book was printed on recycled paper under the promise that no trees were cut to make this book. I'm going to time skip a bit here to 1984. Jim didn't only battle polluters from behind the mask of the fox, he also, and sometimes simultaneously, battled them as Jim Phillips, Kane County Environmental Officer, as seen here in this Aurora Beacon article from July 1984. The article is describing the fox's attack on Wilmar Processing Company, another shady aluminum company, wherein he died, he died and plugged a sewer outlet with cement mix in typical fox fashion. The article goes on to quote one Jim Phillips and his opinion on the company. However, James Phillips, a county environmental officer, said the county feels Wilmar not only causes air pollution, but they have been washing off aluminum dross into the sewer. This man really had some guts to, to do this and then also be quoted in the article about his own vandalism. Over two decades, the Fox called out and attacked those who willingly and recklessly polluted the Fox Valley while making friends along the way. However, it's important to note that not everyone was a fan of the Fox, including one Mr. McAvoy, who wrote to the Aurora Beacon to proclaim that Jim Phillips was not someone to be admired. I suspect this memorial will gloss over the fact that the Fox, in addition to being an environmental activist, was an environmental terrorist. Likewise, your article about the dedication only mentions some of his more theatrical events, not his criminal ones. The Fox was largely famous for acts of industrial sabotage. McAvoy goes on to say that his father was an engineer at the Armor Dial Company, so that's where his vigil comes in. 
He also claims that some of what the Fox did would constitute life in prison in this post 9-11 world, which I find to be a bit of an outrageous claim, but everyone is entitled to their opinion. Skipping ahead again, Jim passed away on October 3rd, 2001 at the age of 70 years old. He was unmarried and had no kids, but left behind quite a legacy. His ashes were spread by friends into the Fox River, and this small monument is in Violet Patch Park in Oswego to honor him. I know I mentioned him throughout, but I do want to stress how important Dick Young was as well for the Fox Valley. Dick passed away on March 23rd, 2011 at 86 years old. He was the Kane County Environmental Officer until 1987, after which he volunteered his time to help out. He also was a co-founder and director of the Kendall County Forest Preserve District, and he had a forest preserve named after him that's within both Kendall and Kane counties, which I think is fitting considering the work he did for both counties. I want to also address how the fox impacted the Fox Valley. What did he actually achieve? Well, I mentioned earlier that Armour Dial did apply for money to improve their environmental output. He also inspired people to become more conscious of their impact on the environment. But I also think it's important that he spoke out in the first place. He called out these large corporations for what they were doing, and he made the public aware of the environmental issues around them. This is U.S. Steel's website today. They now, like so many other businesses, focus on being environmentally conscious and friendly. Now, I'm not saying they're the perfect company, nor am I saying the Fox had anything directly to do with this, but he and others like him put in the work to lead to things like this. And today there are still those in the Fox Valley who have taken up the task of keeping the river clean. The Friends of the Fox River is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to preserve, restore, and protect Fox River watershed's resources. Jim was an excellent storyteller, and once you read Raising Cane, you will realize how much fun detail and little stories I had to trim from what I shared today. His book is available at the Little White School Museum in Oswego. They have it on their website, which I've put here, and they will ship the book to you for only an extra $5. And for your reference, if you try to get it on Amazon, it is over $100 and there's only one copy. So I highly suggest supporting a small museum and purchasing it from the Little White School Museum. Also, the museum, the Little White School Museum will have an exhibition about Jim Phillips, curated by students from Aurora University on display from May 4th to August 4th, 2022. So check it out and support local museums. Thank you for attending this talk.